so a couple things. First of all, I want to just say how proud I am that uh, we have effectively uh, implemented the health care reform and expanded access to now 98% of our residents. There are 400,000 adults and children who had no health insurance and no access to that insurance before we came uh, to office who do today, and I'm very proud of that. And I think the next frontier is cost control and containment. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, in the short term, uh, some steps we've taken are to uh, are to cap those premium uh, increases, and uh, which were had a, having a particular impact on small businesses and working families. And also, uh, uh, with a bill I signed in August uh, that now permits small businesses to aggregate and get the buying power that big firms and and um, uh, and the state, frankly, uh, has. That's a step in the right direction. Payment reform is the next thing. It's a, a set of unanimous uh, recommendations from lots of participants in the uh, in the industry. I want to assure doctors this is not uh, capitation redux. Um, it's uh, it's uh, avoiding some of the hazards of, uh, of capitation. I think that's enormously important. And then I think we have to do, and it, it's not just about cost control, it's, uh, it's also about making sure uh, medical professionals can focus on the medicine and on the, on the practice of, uh, uh, of medicine, is simplify all the back office stuff. I don't know why every single company needs its own set of forms and codes and all the rest of that, that can be uh, made uniform, it seems to me, or at least made more uh, more common. And then I guess the final thing I would say is some medical mal uh, uh, reform. And there's some good models out there being used uh, uh, at, uh, at the University of Michigan and um, uh, at, um, uh, at MGH and so on. Very interested in those, and I'd like to see those in a payment reform bill as well. The right way to do this is to make sure the doctors have a voice in the way it's implemented, in the way it's designed for that matter. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody differs on the basic idea that um, what we want is the healthiest possible doctor-patient relationship and as little uh, in the middle of that as we can, as we can do, um, as we can have. Um, and there are some things that have to be a part of that because of the way we pay for, uh, for health care the way doctors are paid. Um, and, but I think that can be sorted. And I think there, you know, I've talked to a lot of doctors who have some really great ideas about the right way to do this, not just, you know, the wrong way to do it, but really have some great ideas about the right way uh, to do it. So you can be sure that if, uh, if the people honor me with a second term, we will have the voice of physicians and other medical professionals at the table as we're implementing, uh, implementing this. And I think, you know, there's a great tension about how fast to do it or how slow to do it. Folks need relief right now, but we also don't want to throw out um, the good when we're trying to deal with, uh, with the bad. Just one other thing I want to add. I, I think that what we have all learned, and Dr. Bigby, who is our Secretary of Health and Human Services, has helped me understand over the last four or five years, is that the, the more successful we are with universal care, the more pressure there is on the capacity of primary care. Primary care. Not the medical profession generally, but, uh, uh, but uh, primary care providers. And as we look at that, one of the um, issues has been uh, the choices that medical students are making in favor of um, specializations because of how much debt they have um, paying for medical school. And so we have been working with the Bank of America and some others um, in raising funds to do loan forgiveness programs as a way to um, create a real viable option for primary care, uh, uh, for choices to go into primary care.